All right, what is up, guys? So, welcome back to another episode of Dugster Bob Discussions, where we're trying to grow BMX by getting a million people into the sport. So, in this episode, we're going to be talking about some things like Dennis Anderson's Backyard Jam, a little bit of drama. There wasn't too much drama this week. And then some upcoming events. Uh, events are making a comeback in 2021, and it's super exciting to see. And, do you know, there's a few other product releases. We'll, we'll just, let's get right into it. The Dugster Bob Mission. Growing BMX by making it fun and easy to understand. For some of us, it's an escape. For others, it's a passion. But for all of us, it's a lifestyle. You're gonna love this sport. I'm glad you're letting me teach you everything that I know about it. Alright, so those of you guys who have been paying a lot of attention to this podcast, don't forget that every Wednesday the video version comes out on YouTube, and every Tuesday the audio version comes out on all the podcasting platforms. So stay tuned. Each week is different. This week there wasn't really a whole lot going on, so there's not particularly a whole bunch to talk about, but I'm going to run through a few things that I noticed, that I saw, that that's actually really informative for you and and for me so it's really fun to be able to learn together in this podcast the first thing i want to talk about is dennis anderson's backyard jam so this was uh in the upcoming event section last week and it it was just happening as i was posting the podcast so before this one i sat down and i watched it It was like a two hour long stream that that back breakless tv that breakless tv did they recorded the whole thing they, they had a whole bunch of sponsors they had demolition and you know haro all of dennis's sponsors were throwing in cash for these riders and the way it started out is that everyone would take a run unfortunately dennis was hosting the event so he was talking with like chad and with uh cory nastasio and they were just talking so Dennis didn't actually get to ride which is disappointing to me because I would have loved to see him shred his own ramps I think a lot of these guys took it took a few minutes for them to get used to the ramps and kind of figure it out backyard ramps are weird because you have to condense everything and I don't know anyway sometimes you could tell at the beginning of the video that they were getting used to it still so it was really fun to watch this because what they did with each run is the rider would do like a trick or a line and if if they liked the trick they'd throw money in a bucket for that rider so each rider had their own bucket and dennis was like oh sick 540 bar over the box like i got 40 bucks on that they put 40 bucks in there it was it was super fun because you could see how they all value the different tricks and it wasn't like it wasn't biased right so like kevin perrazzo is, is super well-rounded hucker's got a different style than them matt cardova has a different style than them and but they all appreciate good tricks so it's kind of like a pro thing like there, there was absolutely no hate it was good vibes all around and it was, it was really fun to watch so if you haven't watched that go check that out i do recommend sitting down and watching it there <sighs> breakless tv I, I don't know who that is they need to get it together because it was like there was a lot of cutting in and out the vi the camera would go out and it was just poor uh poor video production in my opinion but get past that enjoy the good vibes watch the riding it, it, it's a lot of fun it would have been really cool to be at that event in person and hang out with all the guys I, there's like there's kevin there was pat casey dennis was there um mike hucker matt cordova and uh what's his name the new guy michael mcgallan Mo, mogolan Mo, anyway michael uh he's from columbia i'm pretty sure and he got put on the haro team during that event so he knew beforehand they filmed it a welcome edit but they kind of announced it during the event so that that's really exciting for him dennis anderson is on haro and uh, chad curley's on haro chad was there hanging out he wasn't riding just hanging out but um so it's really cool haro's adding another rider to the team but what do you guys think about like sponsors like haro and like mongoose where the whole core of bmx kind of looks down on them as a brand you know haro's 
just cheap old school brand. They're not really doing much anymore. And oh, Mongoose sells bikes in Walmart like they're junk. But they sponsor some of the biggest name riders. And in my opinion, that's that's the only way to make a living in BMX is by getting on with one of those huge name companies that sells to the masses. So selling to the masses is really looked down upon because it gives BMX a bad name or it gives your brand a bad name in general. But those are, you know, Kevin Peraza, Pat Casey, they're both on Mongoose. You got Chad Curley, you got Dennis Anderson on Haro. So it's it's wild, right? They they sponsor the biggest names, they have the biggest budgets, but then people hate on it. I don't know. I'm curious what you guys think. I think as a, you know, as a rider aspect, if you're just trying to make money in the sport, go for it. If anyone's going to pay you, take that because that is one less dollar that you have to work a real job for and you're able to make it riding your bike. So I don't see any any issues with it. I think some people call it selling out, you know, there's a bunch of different things. But it, it's interesting to think about. Now, the other thing I came across in the recent event section was Viking BMX making titanium components. So this is um, a European brand, and they just make fully tie frame forks and bars. So the the whole idea with tie, if you guys aren't familiar, is titanium is lighter and it's stronger than chromoly. So you're able to get a lot lighter parts. You're able to get parts that are going to last longer. The problem is it's incredibly expensive, just absolutely insane. So when I look through some of their parts, I just looked at a frame, for example, the frame weighed 1.5 kilograms, I think, which is about 3.3 pounds. Most BMX frames are around four to five pounds. So this is a, a whole pound lighter. Now, it costs seventeen hundred dollars. It's that that is so much for just a frame. Like you can build a really really good, fully custom BMX bike for seventeen hundred dollars. Could you imagine spending that much on just a frame? I couldn't. And if if I was like a millionaire, or whatever, or you make six figures a year, I guess you could spend that much on a bike and go fully fully titanium, fully custom. But just just for the average rider who's not in a competitive space, that is just, it's a crazy, crazy amount of money. And is it even worth it? Like, is that extra pound that you're saving going to make you a better rider for that money? It's tough to tell, you know, if you're not even committed and you just want something light because you think it's a magical fix, it's not. It's going to help you out. Yes, of course, but it's not going to magically make you a much better rider and I think, I think titanium kind of gives that cons- misconception that if you buy tie parts, you have really light parts, then you're going to be the best rider in the world. And that is not the case at all. Uh, so, so yeah, it's really crazy to think that they're selling frames for $1,700 and people are actually buying it. I'm sure they are. Uh, it, it would be cool to have a full tie bike one day, but is it a game changer? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. Now, we're going to move into the drama and beef section, which is really lacking this week. There, there wasn't anything particular that stood out to me, but one thing I did come across was the cinema projector stem is coming back again. Um, cinema initially announced the stem like months ago, and everyone was like, what? So the projector stem is a stem that it is, it's got the rise of a top load. So a top load stem rises up. It gives you extra rise. That's why I ride one. It makes it a lot more comfortable for me. I love it. But the projector stem is a front load stem that gives you that rise of a top load. So it just looks goofy. It's like this stem is pointed straight up and it's it's front load. So when it first came out, there definitely was a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of hate for it. And now the the point is that it's kind of becoming more normalized. They're talking about it more. People aren't hating as much. And it's interesting. So there's that whole concept, right, where people come out with a new thing, a new product, and everyone hates it until it's adopted. So I don't know if this stem is getting adopted, if it's becoming more popular. I still don't like it. I don't like the look of it or anything. I get the point, but it's like, I don't know, it's like creating a problem to solve a problem. The, the problem isn't that people like the look of a front load stem, but like the rise of a top load. 
if you write a top load, you write a top load. If you write a front load, you write a front load. So like to me, that's not necessarily actually an issue, but they're portraying it as an issue so that they can sell the stems, but people are buying it. And I mean, it's, it's working good for them. So, so good. I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to read just one comment on a post that they did about it. Dead whip said, I love my cinema erection stem. Good for whips, bars, and wife. <laughs> so that's funny. Um, I, I feel like they deleted a lot of that, the negative comments on their post because I looked through trying to find some, and there really wasn't that many. So maybe maybe not many people hated it, but I, I know for sure they did. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, so it's cool. It, it's cool to see different things get accepted. Just like the triple bar spin deal. Everyone's like, that's just, everyone's just doing too many bar spins. It's not about style anymore, but now it's kind of, it's becoming accepted. So BMX follows this timeline where things are, are kind of pushed out and then thought about, and then, then finally accepted later on. And I think the stem is going through that process. Like I said, I still don't particularly like it, but to each its own. Now, upcoming events, there's actually a handful, and this is really exciting to me to see some things coming up in 2021. The first thing is a do the damn jam in Florida. It's not Swamp Fest. It's nothing like that, but it's just a nice little jam they're going to do on March 6th in Florida. Um, and then the other thing is an Australian national championship, March 13th in Australia. And the reason I want to talk about these two is because they're so contrasty. So the, uh, the Florida is just a jam and the Australian championship is like a UCI contest. And if you don't know, UCI is, is a organization where people compete and earn points based on that and then qualify for the Olympics based on the points. And they, they run a bunch of different contests throughout the United States, throughout the world, where riders can compete to earn points. So they're, they're turning BMX into more of a sport instead of just a hobby. There's a lot of controversy on this, on whether it's good for BMX or whether it's bad for BMX. But the whole point of it right now, contests are going down. Riders are able to compete, make some money. Their sponsors pay them based on performance a lot of times. So that's, that's really good. But a jam, you just show up, you ride, you have fun, you hang out. It's like jams are good vibes. Com uh, com competitions are just intense. You've got to be ready. You've got to hit those runs. You train for competitions. You, you vibe for jams. And that's, how, that's just how it works. So personally, I don't know. I could talk about experiences with that. So jams, generally, you just... You just have more fun, but in a contest, you've got all that stress, you've got all that nervousness, and you can't really focus on what you're doing unless you're like a, a tuned athlete. So it'd be cool to go to one of these UCI contests. There's none in the US in 2021 that I saw. So it, I don't know. Tokyo is coming up after this Australian one, but I don't know. What do you guys think? You guys like watching contests or you like watching jams? I think. Florida Swamp Fest is one of the most popular things right now. And it's more of just a jam. You just hang out, you vibe, you have a good time, you ride bikes with your friends. And that's how it goes. Where I don't know of many people that like tune in to the Australian National Championship. I, most people probably don't even know what's going on with that. So, so yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think about. Leave a comment. Let me know what you like more. You, you, you a jam person or a a contest person. <laughs> now, riders, we've got Jacob Thiem. I, I hope I said his name right. I'd never heard of him until a few months ago when I started seeing him riding with Daniel Sandoval and Jeremy Malott quite a bit. So Jeremy Malott lives in Lake Havasu and Sandoval lives in like um, the LA area. And they've recently been riding a lot. Like Daniel's been going to Lake Havasu and they've just been catching a lot of sessions. So they're all ride for free agent, even Jacob, and Jacob's been with them a lot over these last few months. So the, the most recent thing I saw was a hop double whip off a ledge, which is insane that anyone's even doing that. Caden Stone did a hop double whip off of like a pretty big quarter to flat, but Jacob did this off of a ledge. And now we're moving to the point. So you guys remember back way back when bar spins were first like a thing 
okay? And everyone's like, wow, bar spins are cool. And if you, if you knew bar, bar spins, you were considered pretty good. But now we've shifted to where like the pro riders are just casually doing hop doubles. Just casual hop double bar. It's like, what? Wait, 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 wait. We skipped a thing here. So now everyone's like, everyone does bar spins. Everyone learns bar spins. And so now if you're not doing hop double bars, you're not really serious, which is crazy to me. The, uh, so that's what I think that's, what's going to happen with double whips here in the next five years. It's like, okay, you know, everyone can hop whip, but now we're working on hop double whips and Jacob's setting that bar early in 2021 with the double whips off the ledge. It's just like, you know, flare to double flare where everyone's doing flares now and only the elite do double flares. Everyone's doing whips now. Only the elite do double whips. It's, um, God, that's, that's crazy. Uh, it's just been, you know, watching all of those guys ride, it shows you the true value of getting together with a solid group of friends and, and progressing off that energy because they all have their own different styles. They're all banger riders, but they can, they can get off of each other's energy to just uh, attempt different things and learn things and incorporate different styles. It's like you see Logan Martin and, and Jay Tui riding a lot. And then Logan learned the, the front bike flip because of Jay. And so there's a lot of that combination where some riders who don't necessarily have that, they, they do have a disadvantage because they don't have anyone to vibe with <laughs> during that riding session. Um, yeah, crazy, Jacob. Crazy, crazy hop double whip. I mean, I'm going to call it a hop double whip, even though it wasn't really. Now, the last part here is some product releases. And there wasn't a whole lot. I covered a lot last week. Um, this one, this was last week too, but the Dakota Roach van slip-on is a thing. I don't know how anyone rides in slip-ons. That's not for me. There's no way. I, I used to ride in like Osiris, like super high top shoes because I wanted to protect my ankles. And now I'll ride like mid tops. So my ankles are barely covered, but not really. But slip-ons, you've got to be a next, like next level confident to ride in slip-ons. You've got to be fully confident that you can not hit your foot very hard. Like imagine catching a whip and then hitting your crank bolt or the, the base of your crank on your foot with just real thin slip-ons. No, thank you. No, thank you. Vans has done really good incorporating BMX into some different shoes they they do they have a Larry Edgar vans they have these Dakota Roach vans slip-ons they have a demolition vans they have a cult vans so they they partner really good to create some BMX specific shoes which is a thing BMX doesn't really have you know Nike dropped their pro team a while ago and everything is skate focused with Nike now uh so good for vans one thing though is i think the releases go in phases so they release a certain amount and then the shoes go away and then they release a different one or they release more. However, it works. It's not like these Dakota Roach van slip-ons are, are here everywhere that vans are sold and they're going to be out forever and then just keep updating colorways. And to me, that's kind of weird, but what can you do, right? At Vans Guy, make more BMX shoes all the time for everyone and make them cheaper. God, they're like, $80. I, I think, I don't even know how much the Dakota Roach ones are, but um, here, hold on. I'm going to look. Oh my God. $75, $75 slip-ons little. Lit. Oh, well, I mean, people love it. People love Dakota. People love Vans. So good, good for Vans for partnering with them. They do, they do a couple things with the Vans uh, the BMX specific ones to make them a little bit better. So like the insoles a lot softer than the basic vans. They put a, a strip of rubber over the top part that goes around like the toe and where the, the rubber connects because a common thing is for that rubber to peel off. So they put a connection thing over top and, and that keeps the shoe held together a lot better. So, I mean, they, it's not like just an overpriced cheap vans. They do put the technology into there. They do put the innovation, but that, man, I have, I've like, I don't pay more than $40 for shoes. If I find some Vans or Nikes on sale at, or at Ross, like I'll pick them up and that's it. $75 shoes, shoes wear down way too fast. Like every three months, that's a lot of money. Oh God, got me all worked up. 
Um, the other thing I saw was new colorways on some of the 2021 We the People frames. We the People is notorious for coming out with killer colorways like the ghost gray. I think it's a Pathfinder. The ghost gray, the, uh, the Versus has a really cool red and black colorway, but they just dropped some new colors, kind of similar to Colt. This last last week, we talked about Colt coming up with a bunch of new frame lines, and a lot of them are their same frame lines, just in different colorways. So we the people's doing that, and that tells me that we are moving a lot closer to 2022 BMX bikes, because usually some of the signature bikes copy the signature colorways from the frames, so that might be a good sneak peek at what is to come. Check out the new We The People colorways on their website. And yeah, they uh, they commented on my last podcast. So if you're watching this, reply to my email. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I think it's weird when, you know, the content I make is for the newer writers who are getting back into it or the older writers getting back into it. So it's weird to me when like my friends who are hardcore in BMX or like different brands or, or pro riders like watch my stuff. I'm like, this isn't really for you, but but go off. I appreciate it. <laughs> so so that's cool. Uh, cool colorways. Speaking of colorways, Odyssey has a new swirl color, the navy toothpaste. I don't like it, but maybe you like it. You need to check it out. It goes well with the dark wave frame color. It's like that navy color with, well, the toothpaste color, and it's all swirled together. So I used to ride black and white swirl petals. It went really good with my colorway and the black and white swirl grips. So if this is your colorway, this is perfect. I, Odyssey does really good at, at coming up with different colors, but more so coming up with color options. Like the twisted PC pedals, you can get in probably 20 different color options, including the different swirl colors. And it, as far as I know, they're the only brand going that in depth on colors. And you know how I feel about colors. I think making bikes, it, making everything in different colors is great because we identify with the colors. That's how we express ourselves through our bike. So good job, Odyssey. I, I don't like the color, but I do like the, uh, the color development. So the fireball tires, the cloth fireball tires are restocked. Once again, it's a really solid street tire with cobweb technology. And the whole idea with the cobweb technology is it makes the construction a lot stronger and denser. And then it's more resistant to grind, wear, and tear. So when you're doing a feeble, your tire is rubbing up on that ledge. And with this, uh, I, Merit has a good grind technology too. But it, it keeps the tire lasting a lot longer. And the fireballs were a really, really popular thing. Uh, God, I want to say a year ago. And then they've kind of fallen off and I haven't seen too much about them. So it's good to see them coming back out. I know in the lives, we always talk about different tires. We talk about different, um, different tires that are good. I always say demolition momentums, best tire ever. But now that our favorite rider, Brad Sims is riding for Maxxis, maybe that's going to be the new recommendation. Maybe we're going to start saying that Maxxis grifters, I mean, they are literally the best tire uh, they're, they're light, but they're super expensive. So I take that into consideration. I don't know how I feel about super expensive tires because they wear down. If you're getting them for free, like Brad, then that's not really an issue. But when you have to pay $40 every couple months or 80, they're $40 each 80. Oh my God. Um, I want to say the fireballs are, are around 20 something, probably no God, no, probably thirties. Maybe they're 40, probably 36. That's my guess. 36. But I always guess the prices. I should research the prices, but you guys, you guys will look it up. If you're curious about the fireball, you'll look up the price. Uh, speaking of price though, I did talk about the, we, the people hybrid free coaster last week. And when we, the people commented, it was telling me, they told me that, um, the hybrid free coaster was only one forty. That is crazy. Because the BSD Revolution was like 230. So granted, this isn't the same technology as the Revolution. But 140 for a, a free coaster slash cassette thing is one of the, I mean, it's got to be one of the cheapest options out there. So with that being said, I'm really curious to see how it holds up. Um, I was talking to Barrick yesterday and Barrick was saying he probably wants to scoop one. So hopefully he gets one and I can test it out and let you guys know how it feels and how it actually rides. All right, 
Well, that is actually everything I talked about. I don't think this one was very long. I keep looking at my clock and I don't think we went for very long, but there wasn't too much to talk about. I hope you guys learned some new information about this. And, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you're here listening to this and uh, learning more about BMX with me. So we will see you in the live on Friday or Sunday, whichever one you prefer. But keep shredding, guys. Keep helping me grow BMX. One million people in the sports, the goal. So, so yeah, have a great day. Thank you.